Hello, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet, welcoming you to another episode of Vet Chat, the UK's number one veterinary podcast. And I'm super pleased today to have Shireen Williams on, who is a graduate of Nottingham Vet School, one of the originals, a claim to fame, and uh, also represents Brooke Action for Working Horse and Donkeys as the global animal health advisor. So, Shireen, thank you for coming on the uh, the podcast. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me. Really nice to be here. And Brooke is such an amazing charity. You know, I've, I've obviously known about Brooke for a long time, and uh, not quite since when it was founded in the in the 30s, but, you know, certainly during my veterinary career. And so thank you for all of the fabulous work you do for Working Equits. But of course, as I've been learning, you do treat other animals as well, don't you? Yes, I mean, yes, we were founded in yeah, 1934 by a wonderful uh, woman called Dorothy Brook, who um, was actually the wife of an army general based in Egypt. So yeah, our organisation really started um, after the First World War, when Dorothy Brook um, was really quite horrified at the plight of the war horses that had been so pivotal in helping a, helping with the war effort and then were continuing to really support the post-war effort in helping rebuild um, cities and work for local people. It was obviously a really difficult time across the globe um, and their health and welfare was really suffering and that's really what she has started the organisation to address is where these animals are helping people um, can we do more to help them and and that really has continued um, over the last hundred years and still is at the heart of everything we do but certainly as part of the animal health team which I'm, I'm part of a wonderful global team of vets, farriers and agro-pharmacists. Um, we realise that vets treat more than one species and we don't have equine vets in the countries in which we work in these vets are treating every single species yeah. of which working equids are actually a smaller proportion so when we're thinking about our work which really um focuses on teaching and training so what we we don't um provide treatments ourselves other than in real emergencies and we don't have hospitals or sanctuaries what we do is have uh, local teams which go and work with those people who are providing animal health care of which there is always somebody they might be community um, animal health workers they might be para vets or they might be veterinarians but somebody is usually providing some treatment to the animals and our work certainly around that is um, to mentor and to train those animal health practitioners and to strengthen the system in which they work in so that's how we've kind of come to be involved in in wider projects around animal health not just simply focusing on um, horses and donkeys and obviously we're doing this um, recording I'm in Liverpool in the centre of Liverpool and, and you're very close to Liverpool Street in London aren't you you're in the city we are, yes. Like I, I came into the office hoping for um, better Wi-Fi than uh, the rural area where I live. I'm not sure that's been true. But yes, our our UK office or sort of our global HQ is based um, just outside Liverpool Street Station. So yeah, it's a bit of a funny world where we're getting off the train with bankers and lawyers and, um, and we're an organisation full of animal welfare advocates. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a really nice place. We've actually, next week, we've got... Um, our international senior leadership team, so our country directors from each of our countries across Asia, Africa and Latin America are actually coming for a, um, an in-person meeting. I think it's only the second one since COVID. So it'll be, we, we do a huge, a huge amount online, um, but there is still need for face-to-face -face meetings and um, face-to-face trainings. So uh, we do have um, we travel to the countries that we work in and we also have our colleagues come mm. here to, to our office here as well. And it is nice. I think it is important to do face to face. I'll be at the webinar vet saying it, you know, and we've done obviously webinars for the last 13 years. And a lot of stuff can be done online. And in fact, it's good because it's saving carbon and saving uh, money as well. But obviously, 
uh, it is great to be able to meet face to face as well to develop those relationships. Yeah, I guess in a similar way that you were probably slightly ahead of the, well, quite a lot ahead of the COVID times. And I guess in the same sense we were, because we've always used online training. Yeah. We have a huge online learning program. We do a lot um, of online learning and online discussion, but it it is a pra- working with animals is a practical um yeah. vocation isn't it and i think during covid we pushed it to the limits we had um we had a farriery training about how to build fires to heat metals to certain temperatures um being live streamed from newmarket to quite a rural area area in senegal and that was obviously yeah. because we couldn't travel but i think a good example of where actually that training would be most beneficial in person <laughs> Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And obviously, um, veterinary surgeon from uh, Nottingham, did you do some uh, practice in, in ordinary practice before you went into Brook as well? Yes, yes. So it's, yeah, we're always proud to say that we're the guinea pig year. <laughs> yeah. And um, we had, yeah, a wonderful, I mean, obviously everyone, well, most people don't, they, they love the vet school they went to, but we had a yeah. really, I think, unique experience at Nottingham because we were the first new vet school for, for quite a while, which was a bit controversial in itself. But I think we had like a very, quite a young dynamic teaching staff and we knew them really well because at the start there was more of them than there were of us and um so yeah we kind of kept up with that alumni very closely yeah. and, and and it's been really positive um but following yeah following graduation I worked um I, I did go straight into equine welfare but based very much in the UK at that time so I worked for Red Wings and um, the horse right. sanctuary yeah. and the equine welfare organization based in Norfolk and worked very much in the center's hospital there treating at the time there were 1200 um, horses donkeys and mules that had been rescued Um, also worked very closely with the RSPCA and um, I think within about six months of graduating I was one of the vets at Appleby Horse Fair so working so that was really wonderful to kind of see um, that I guess different horse owning communities which I maybe hadn't been as exposed to at, at vet school um as yeah I'd sort of seen much more performance horse work mm. and I think equine welfare and and those kind of communities was much more the area that I was interested in and then after that I worked in practice in mixed practice in Bedfordshire for a few years two or three years um and, and that was also really good to be in a sort of commercial vet setting so obviously charity work comes with a lot of challenges but talking to owners or uh, having to charge for your time or dealing with insurance claims isn't one of them so I think it that was really good for me in the sense of kind of exposing um, and mm. just being part of the the veterinary community um, I then went traveling for a year which was wonderful <laughs> and um, went backpacking around Asia and Africa and had a wonderful time did do some um, animal work also did um, sort of some uh community education work and and things like that but on the whole had a really good year and then I worked in Australia for for a year again so based in Victoria um and that was mainly some mixed but mainly small animal kind of locum work um to mix in with kind of being able to travel around Australia and that's actually then where from there is where I saw the advert for the Brooke job and it's to be honest working for an organization like Brooke had always been my long game it's one of the reasons that I went into veterinary medicine my dad um, is actually from Sri Lanka so I spent a lot of time growing up um, spending time with our family there and that was really the driving force behind me wanting to be a vet is kind of seeing animals in lower middle income countries and understanding animal welfare from a different cultural perspective is really what drove me into yeah, veterinary medicine so um somewhere like Brooke or these kind of international animal health organizations had always been where I'd wanted to be really yeah I had to do my interview from a camper van in somewhere in Australia (laughs) so uh, yeah and that was yeah before the days that zoom was quite so commonly used so yeah um, but yeah it's been and yeah then I've been here um it'll be eight years soon so it's been and continues to be good fun yeah yeah no excellent Obviously, as you said, there's challenges working, you know, for charities uh, as there are for um, working in clinical, you know, commercial practices as well. 
But obviously working in these countries also where infrastructure isn't always as strong as it is in the UK and, and elsewhere. And, and I know, for example, uh, you know, there's a difficulty in getting hold of pharmaceuticals sometimes for for um, basic treatment of, of the horses, cattle, dogs and cats that we see. And I know you're doing some really interesting work with WVA at the moment around trying to develop essential medicine lists, which obviously has been something that's been quite common in the human field, but maybe not so much in the animal field. Perhaps tell me a little bit about what you're getting up to in that area as well, which sounds so fascinating. Yes, yes, it's certainly, um, it's a big part of my work at the moment. And again, it kind of really stems from the way in which Brooke works, which, as I mentioned, is to work with local animal health practitioners to be there while they're doing their job in a normal setting, as opposed to kind of in a more what we might consider kind of artificial charity run hospital setting and and one of the benefits of working in that way is that we can understand the real life challenges of what we call this kind of last mile animal health setting so where we've got the like the local animal health practitioners be they paravets community members those people that are treating animals on a day-to-day basis and so Brooke work with over 6,000 of them across Asia, Africa and Latin America. And when we look to our data from, from when we're working and mentoring them, we could see that consistently across years of our work, more than half of them don't have access to medicines that we would say are essential, such as pain relief or broad spectrum antimicrobials. And that's despite us working very closely with them. So we'll see huge improvements in their clinical practice. So our vets are mentoring and training them to handle animals better, to take pulse rates, to to do to listen to lung sounds to do lameness exams so all of those kind of areas their clinical practice is really improving their communication with owners is really improving but what we just could not get above this 50 percent is their what they're carrying in their kit in the field and that really made us think like if this is happening for us is this happening in other places too or is this just something that brooke is experiencing Mm -hmm. And then we, so what we did in the first instance is look at government health posts, so particularly in Ethiopia, where we felt there was um, more of an issue. We looked at, um, I think, more than 700 case records from um, government vet posts across a, a certain period of time to see what were the medicines they are actually using. And if we're honest, it was actually worse than we were expecting. What we saw with that is that there was no access to pain relief at all, but we are seeing surgery happening. We're so we're seeing cesareans, we're seeing all the things you would expect. We're seeing dehorning, um, these incredibly painful procedures, we're seeing infectious diseases, um, all with not being not having access to any non-steroidals or, or form of pain relief at all. And then actually what what we are seeing used is that 100% of the cases um, were treated with either an anthelmintic or an antimicrobial. And I think it was about 87% of all cases would have a combination of Oxytet, Penstrep and Ivermectin because those were the drugs that the vets have available. Mm. And obviously, I don't think you need to be a a specialist in either animal welfare or um, antimicrobial resistance to understand that that is a a real concern. So Mm. from that, we then um, sort of started to look like this is a huge topic and, and a big concern and became aware that the World Veterinary Association were also looking into a sort of similar issues. And we actually launched a, a joint project of which the first stage was a, um, a, a global survey to, to understand better the experiences of the global veterinary community. And I guess, unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, what we saw was that this is a really big issue. So we had um, more than 700 responses from uh, 36 different countries. And of those, 80% of the respondents felt that vets' ability to address animal health needs were restricted due to challenges in accessing medicines. 
We had more than a third didn't have access to medicines to perform humane euthanasia. Ten countries reported um, the unavailability of any form of pain relief. And again, more than a third highlighted a lack of access to vaccines such as foot and mouth, um, tetanus and rabies. So the, the problem was big and, um, and global. And um, so I think when we put our heads together and trying not to have a big panic or feel a bit hopeless, we often look to our human health colleagues and think, well, this has probably been or is or was an issue within global human health at some point. How did they address it? And certainly the World Health Organization um, have done a lot on this, and they estimate that more than 2 billion people um, have no access to essential medicine, and this effectively cuts them off from advances in modern science and medicine. And I think when we think about the animal health world, we do tend to lag behind them. So while we don't have the numbers of, for animals affected by this, I think we could assume that it was larger than that. And the way in which the sort of at the base of so much of the WHO work around this is this essential medicines list of which they created their first one in 1977. Um, and it's updated every two years. And importantly, it's not a compendium of every medicine. It's a prioritized list. So globally, what are the medicines that are essential for, for people to do their jobs? And what we realized is that we don't have that same equivalent in the animal health world. And we really felt that this was a gap that needed filling. And that's where this project has, has really grown from. No, that's fantastic. And I think it's... Um... It's so important to realise that, you know, using the Pareto principle, probably 20% of the medicines treat 80% of the diseases. So things like rabies, obviously really important. Uh, your painkillers, your euthanasia um, products. So actually going for, for example, something like phenylbutazone, which you can only really use in horses is perhaps not the answer, but go for more of a uh, broad spectrum non-steroidal like a meloxicam that can treat obviously many different species yeah and that that is exactly our learning on this and i think why brooke is so involved in in a project that spans so many species so um the essential medicines list our project with the wva it builds on the success of wasava so this the small animal veterinary association and um, they in 2020 released a list for cats and dogs and I was uh, quite jealous really that they only have two species to worry about um ours sort of um when we looked at the um the list for livestock we've got eight species so we've got large ruminants small ruminants equids pigs poultry aquaculture bees and rabbits and we're actually in discussions about whether we need to add camels on as well um so it's, it is a really large project and but certainly from brooke's point of view that has very much been our learning that going for an individual i guess an individual medicine and certainly an individual species is within animal health systems that are stressed that are weak it isn't sustainable so it would be easier <laughs> or in the short term for us to ship phenylbutazone over to the countries where we need it or to um arrange for that to be purchased but long term, that's not sustainable. And what we know to be true is that in five years that that supply will not be there anymore. And so this project certainly looks at strengthening access to medicines for all um, animals and sort of really looking at that system strengthening. So, for example, if you want to, countries need to be able to create their own regionally appropriate list obviously what's relevant in Europe or America or parts of Asia will not be relevant to Africa and, and vice versa but what this list really should do is act as a blueprint on which countries can form their own committees use the evidence from the expert working groups that we formed to then form their own lists and then go about um, lightly a, a process of of prioritizing or looking at what do they 
think should be available, what actually is available, how should they prioritize that, where, where are the weaknesses in their systems, and that will be different for different countries. For example, thinking specifically about um, one of our countries that we work, that this is a, a really big issue in, is certainly Ethiopia, and um, yeah, where it would... And sometimes it does it does feel like the thing that you want to do, which would be to take over a big suitcase of phenylbutazone. Um, certainly history has taught us that that is not the way in which to address things in a sustainable way. If yeah. while that might be kind of a, a sticking plaster on a on a on a bigger wound as such, um, in the long run it won't actually improve access beyond um, a very small number of animals. And and that can be really difficult, I think, especially for our teams and certainly even for myself on, on my last visit to Ethiopia um, with two of my colleagues, Abdi and, and Meles, we were faced with um, a horse that had actually been attacked by a hyena that's quite actually, unfortunately, quite common there because animals will be tied up outside grazing and and wild animals are, are roaming. And um, this animal had an incredibly large wound that was completely infested with maggots. The animal certainly looks systemically unwell. Um, and there was yeah myself and my two Brook colleagues and the local government vet that were kind of looking at this um, animal while we were actually there doing a, um, a different training. And it just really became clear that for all the skills and knowledge and competency of the four vets that stood around that animal, we didn't, what we had access to was pen strep um and that actually was it so what we needed was obviously a, a more appropriate antimicrobial pain relief sedation potentially um euthanasia medicines whereas the conversations we were having to have were do we use pen strip do we try and put this animal down without um access to humane euthanasia drugs and like what's what's worse here and so what we ended up doing was cleaning the wound, which obviously would have been incredibly painful because it wasn't stated, um, and sort of trying to keep flies away and, and such like, giving it a course of pen strep, which questionably not the right thing to use for a, for a working equid, and then using our own paracetamol. So we had first aid kits for ourselves. I mean, paracetamol, yes, can be used, but in usually, well, in my experience, in conjunction with other non steroidals and it just really hit home for us that yeah for all for all of the skills and knowledge there for that animal it, it didn't make a difference that there were four vets really stood around it because we didn't have yes. access and and one of my colleagues there Meles, was sort of saying that it's really like doing your job with one hand tied behind your back and mm. that really resonated for me and and so it's incredibly challenging for us especially for our colleagues but what we need is not to kind of parachute medicines in that will then disappear and we need sustainable supply chains and demand from vets from owners from communities for these medicines yeah. so that they can exist within the um, animal health systems within that country and that they will be there for the for the long run and for other animals that are outside of the like the reach of equine welfare charities or other animal welfare charities we need all vets to have access to these medicines so that they can use the knowledge and skills that we take so long and carefully build in people um so that they can use those skills to make good decisions and have positive outcomes for for the animals and owners we really need um you know as well as export or import we we need to actually develop centers within countries or certainly within regions to start producing non-steroidals uh, anesthetic drugs you know different types of antibiotic because obviously as you say if we're just using the same antibiotic all the time there's almost certainly going to be resistance that develops in those situations isn't that yeah and exactly this is the thing it's a huge this like access to medicines matters to more than just vets and to animals mm. as well like this is a one health issue we know that yeah, yeah we're getting 
the overuse of particular antimicrobials because they're the only ones that are available or where, in our experience where there isn't access to uh, pain relief, we're just seeing the continuous use of ivermectin and oxytetracycline mm. and steroids because that's that's what's there. But we know that diseases or antimicrobial resistance, um, also like food safety, these animals are going into the food chain, biodiversity, these don't aren't confined to borders. These are global issues that will affect the the One Health, the wider One Health um, environment, yeah. and we can't really afford to to ignore them. Um, and yeah, that's where coming. It is a huge. It's a huge issue that I think globally we have a responsibility as the veterinary community to to address. Um, and I think that we the the starting place for this is like every all these big projects have to start somewhere don't they and i think having this essential list of veterinary medicines this prioritized list in each country ideally that then can act as a um, a way in which countries can audit themselves they can look at what they've said they need yes. what's actually available and then they can prioritize which ones they need and how they get them. And that, yeah, that will be different in different countries. But I certainly think like the potential for the livestock numbers across Africa is and Asia, but in Africa in particular is huge. These are huge markets that at the moment, like as we said, that there's no non-steroidals available. Yeah. And like that to me seems like a huge opportunity for pharma to be involved in this. And obviously for me personally, I want animals to have access to pain relief, but there's also a huge business opportunity here. So I think we as the veterinary, the international animal health community and the sort of vets within that need to put our heads together and think how we make the case for this for so mm. that others see the need, but also the potential um, in these markets that, um, that that we see, to be honest. And of course, this list I know is, is imminently coming out to be published. We're recording this in at the end of May and hopefully uh, certainly by the end of the summer, this will be out there and available as a essential medicine list which can then be adapted to the various regions and countries as well so yeah it sounds like a fantastic initiative by brook and by wva i know it's uh, it's being sort of checked and looked at at the moment so we will uh, definitely push this when when it, it does go live as well but it, it's it's a really fascinating subject and it's something you know as a vet in the uk i really don't think about because I'm not aware of those issues you know we have non-steroidals we have different types of antibiotics we're, we're very very fortunate as you say what we can do for animals because if we took all of our medicines away from us it would be a really really tough job you know it, as you say even doing basic um, cleaning of wounds in an animal that has no sedation one is dangerous for the animal dangerous for the vet. Uh, it's not right that the, the animal needs to suffer during that. So thank you so much for this fabulous work you're doing. And we are looking forward to the publication so we can uh, promulgate this uh, podcast even more. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me and following the work that we're um, doing. It's really been yeah, a huge pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Shireen. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This is Anthony Chadwick, and this has been another episode of that chat. Take care. Bye.